begin our look, our survey, of some of the prophets found in the Bible. Last time that I spoke, I kind of gave an introduction, an overview. And today I'd like to take a look at the prophets of the time of the patriarchs. Uh, these are prophets and prophetesses that are found in the book of Genesis. And this period of time is before the time of written tradition. These prophets and prophetesses, their stories and their messages were shared orally to the people of their time and place. And the record in history of their work and their message was passed orally down from generation to generation until the time of Moses, when Moses actually recorded in written form the stories found in the book of Genesis. And so today, I'd like to look at uh, seven individuals briefly, talk a little bit about who they were and what we know about them, and the message that they shared for the time and place that God called them. The first of the prophets that uh, we know of is Enoch. And uh, we don't know very much about Enoch. He lived, of course, before the flood. He was a righteous man. And uh, the a direct descendant of Adam as the oldest son. And in the age of the patriarchs, the word patriarch comes from patri, which is Latin for father. So in this time of the patriarchs, it was a family religion. And the oldest son received the blessing and the inheritance, normally, of the birthright that started with Adam. Adam, as, of course, the first man, received direction directly from God and from the angels. And he passed on this responsibility and blessing to his oldest son, which should have been Cain. But of course we know that uh, Cain, by his actions, by his murder of his younger brother Abel, forfeited that blessing. It went on to Shem, and that was passed down from Shem to Enoch. Enoch is the first person that is recorded to be actually a prophet, someone who received messages and shared messages beyond just to the immediate family. Uh, in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, Ellen White talks about Enoch and uh, describes him as e an evangelist, someone who tried to reverse and to change the way that the world was living. He preach to the people and warn the people that their evil lifestyle was going to bring destruction, that they needed to stay true to God. And uh, in Genesis we read that Enoch walked with God, and then that God took him. He was no longer to be found. Enoch was translated. He did not face death. The only message that we really know about Enoch recorded in the Bible is actually found in the book of Jude, one of the smallest books in the New Testament. And in Jude verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, it talks about how Enoch prophesied about the coming of Christ. And so, of course, that promise was first given to Adam and Eve when they were expelled from the garden. But that promise of the coming Messiah was understood even from that early time. And Enoch is mentioned as sharing this prophecy and trying to remind people of the coming of Jesus and the necessity of following in God's direction, in God's way of life. Now, the next person that we would consider to be a prophet is someone all of you have heard about, I'm sure. Noah. And we find the story of Noah starting in chapter 6 of Genesis. And, of course, as you remember, God appeared to Noah and spoke to Noah and warned him 
of the coming destruction of the earth by water. That he was going to send rain and a flood. And he told Noah to prepare a boat, a ship, what we call an ark, so that people and life on this earth could survive. And he told Noah to share the warning, to preach this message to his friends, his neighbors, his family, to the whole world, to let people know, to warn people, so they would have a chance. They would have the opportunity to escape from the coming destruction. And of course, uh, Noah preached for 120 years about this coming destruction. And he and his family, together, they built this big ship, this ark. And uh, eventually, the flood came. And of course, Noah was laughed at. The people thought that he was crazy. They thought that he was foolish. They thought that his message was insane. They had never seen rain. They had never seen a flood. The people did not believe what Noah warned. And even when signs were given, such as the animals coming and going on to the ark, uh, people still refused the message. And so only Noah and his immediate family and their wives were saved from that destruction. We also, in Genesis chapter 9, we read another prophecy that Noah gave, and that was related to his three sons. Uh, there was an incident where Noah got drunk, he fell asleep naked in his tent, and his grandson of his youngest son saw him and brought his father, and they made fun and laughed at him, and then told his two older brothers. The two older brothers, they showed respect to their father. And as a result of this incident, Noah prophesied about the future of his three sons. And as we look at history, we see that the prophecies that Noah made about Shem, Ham, and Japheth came to pass. And, uh, and so Noah was one of the earliest prophet that we have written record of a lot of what he had to say and the prophecies that he made about the coming of the flood and related to his children. And this gift of prophecy was passed down from generation to generation. The eldest son was the priest of the family, and he was the one who spoke with God, and whom God revealed himself in vision. And we don't have records of all of these men and all of the messages that they received, and it isn't until several generations later at the time of Abraham, that we find reference to God speaking to a man, and this man sharing his message with his family, and following God's direction. And of course, Abraham is called uh, the father of the faithful, because when God appeared to him and gave him these messages and warnings, he accepted and followed these directions to leave his home, to leave his family, the relatives living in Ur and in Babylon, and they, they left. They, they left that place, taking their, their livestock and their immediate family with them, traveling first to Syria and then later leaving and going to Canaan. And Abraham lived his whole life as a nomad, he traveled from place to place, living in tents. He never actually built or lived in a city or town. Um, he did own some land. He bought one plot of land to use as a burial place, a, a cemetery, a tomb for his family. But that was the only land he ever owned. And uh, God appeared to Abraham on several occasions 
promising him that he and his family, his descendants, would be countless, that they would cover the earth, and that the land of Canaan, everything that he saw, would be owned and occupied by his descendants. And this was the message that Abraham believed, and it's one he passed down to his children. And Abraham's son, Isaac, was the next patriarch, and he inherited his father's uh, blessing and his father's gift, and he walked as his father had walked. He followed God, he obeyed him, and God shared himself with Isaac as he had with his father Abraham. And we don't read a lot about Isaac's visions or messages. We only have one instance, only one occasion where we know that he prophesied. And that was related to his two sons, to Jacob and Esau. And of course, you remember the story how Jacob, the younger of the two twins, deceived his father to secure the birthright and special blessing. He wanted that relationship with God. He wanted to be the family priest. He felt that connection with God was important. Where his older brother Esau, who by custom and tradition should have taken that position and blessing, he saw no value to that. He had no interest in walking in God's way. In fact, he was a rebel. He went away and lived his own life, his own style. He disobeyed and dishonored his parents of the choices that he made. And, and so God passed Esau over and gave the blessing to, to Jacob. And uh, later when Esau came in and asked for a blessing, his father did bless him and described his lifestyle as would be one of a, a wanderer, a vagrant. And we see as we look at the descendants of Esau living in the land of Edom, which is today uh, part of Jordan and uh, Arabia, that the descendants of Esau have continued to live that kind of lifestyle, very nomadic, uh, wild, often violent, lots of conflict between different groups and clans and tribes. And, uh, and so, following Isaac, of course, was Jacob. And Jacob was, God revealed himself to Jacob in a very famous vision. The vision found of Jacob, what was, as he was running away, he spent the night and in, as he dreamed that night, he saw the ladder between earth and heaven. And angels moving up and down the ladder, representing God's sending messages and working with men, and not rejecting him. And, uh, and God reassured Jacob, even as he was fleeing from his brother and fleeing from his family, that he would not be forgotten, and that he was accepted by God. And uh, later, when Jacob was working in Syria for his father-in-law, uh, God revealed himself to Jacob. And in something that we think might be kind of silly or mundane, not so important, uh, Jacob had problems with his father-in-law. His father-in-law was a very greedy man. His father-in-law was a very manipulative, a very cunning man. He was always trying to take advantage of people around him. If he saw the smallest opening, ah, oh, I'm going to grab that. Oh, I can use this person in this way. I'll do it. And, of course, Jacob's wives was a good example of that. Uh, Jacob wanted to marry the younger daughter, Rachel. And instead, his father-in-law gave him the older daughter on his wedding. <laughs> he ended up with two wives instead of one. He had to work 14 years instead of seven in order to 
to pay off the dowries for his two wives. And one of the things that his father-in-law did was he kept changing his pay. They would have contracts about, you know, how are we going to pay you? And about seven times his father-in-law changed their pay arrangement. And it wasn't Jacob wanting to change the pay, it's his father. Oh, uh, you're making too much money. Let's change the conditions. Oh, you're still making lots of money from me. Oh, we'll change the conditions again. So many times his father-in-law changed how he was paying his son-in-law, Jacob. And one of the conditions at one point was about the, the animals and what color the animals were. You know, if they were if they were solid color, if they were mixed color of animals. And depending on what color pattern of the animals, that determined which person owned the animal. If it was a certain color or a certain pattern, then it was Jacob's animal. And if it was another pattern or another color, it was his father-in-law's animal. And so God in a vision told Jacob what to do about this problem and how he could improve his wealth through the animals. And it seems like a silly thing to us, but the Bible records this very mundane prophecy, this mundane message that God shared with Jacob so that he could improve his situation with his father-in-law. And at the end of Jacob's life, when Jacob was dying in Egypt at an old age, surrounded by his 12 sons and his two famous grandsons, the sons of Joseph, Jacob prophesied about each of his sons and the two grandsons of Joseph. And we have a very long chapter where Jacob, each son, Joseph, or Jacob describes what their future would be like. And of course, among those prophecies is the most famous related to Judah, because uh, Jacob prophesied that from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah would come, and that the kings would come from the tribe of Judah. Judah was not the oldest son, and so it's a little unusual that uh, his father made that kind of prediction centuries before David would come to the throne. The last person I'd like to talk about for just a few minutes this morning is Joseph. Joseph was one of the youngest sons of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and uh, the youngest sons were Joseph and Benjamin. They were the sons of his favorite wife, Rachel. And, uh, of course, as you remember the story of Joseph, he was father's favorite. He was the oldest son of his favorite wife. And so, Jacob spoiled Joseph. He gave him extra benefits. He showed him more attention. He took him around when he was out traveling in the fields and inspecting things. And uh, you can imagine how the other brothers fell, right? Have any of you had your brothers or sisters treated more specially by your parents? <laughs> Are you felt that at least? <laughs> Maybe you felt that. Maybe it wasn't true, but you felt that way, right? Oh, you always do that for her. Or, oh, you're always giving him more time. Or, you know, you're treating them more favorably. No. Brothers and sisters are very sensitive to that, right? The slightest amount of difference. Oh, you did this for him. <laughs> you know, you have to do something for me. We want balance. Right? We don't like it when a sibling, when a brother or a sister gets more. You know, so even from very small, it's like, oh, you gave him more cookies, or that serving of cake is bigger than mine. You know? We look at every little thing, right? 
So you can only imagine that when Jacob showed all of this time and affection and, and gave his son all of these things, the brothers were not happy, right? They were not happy. And they were especially unhappy because he was younger. You know, they were older. And they were doing more work than him. He was the youngest son. They were doing all the work and he was getting all the reward. They weren't happy with that. But, you know, Jacob saw something in Joseph that was unique. Joseph was interested in the family history. He was interested in God and he was... He soaked up the stories that his father told and shared with the family. He, he took, he, he just wanted to know everything. And he, he paid special attention to these things. And he had a relationship with God that his other brothers did not have. And his father saw that in him. And that was another binding thing between the two of them. And even as a boy, Joseph was shown a vision by God. And actually there were two visions that he had. The first was the, a field, you know, there were sheaves of, of grain at the harvest time. And there was a sheaf for each brother. They had each collected a bundle and tied it up. And it was sitting in the field. And while all of them were gathered, bringing their bundles, all the sheaves bowed down. They bent over to Joseph's sheep. His sheep stood up and all of theirs fell down, facing him like, oh, you know, honor to you. And so Joseph shared his vision with his family. How do you think they reacted? <laughs> You know, they, all, they had all these other feelings, and then, oh yeah, God showed me a vision. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. We're going to bow down to you, the youngest? I don't think so. No way. Never. They laughed and made jokes about him. And, uh, and his father probably was thinking, wow, what is this? He had questions, I'm sure. And then Joseph revealed another vision that God showed him. And this time it was the, the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowed down to him at night. And of course, everybody understood what that meant. Well, the stars are his brothers. The moon was his mother, and the sun was his father. They're all bowing down to him. And that was just too much. Even his father was like, you know, Joseph, um, you need to kind of calm down here. This is not really the best message to be sharing with us. Are you sure about this message? Do you really think God told you this, or is this just something you imagine? But, uh, you know, Jacob, I'm sure, he pondered these things in his heart. He knew that Joseph had a relationship with God that was strong. And, uh, and yet, even that message was one that he had trouble understanding and accepting at that point in time. And uh, because of these various factors, Joseph's brothers hated him. And, uh, of course, you know what happened. He was sent by his father to check up <coughs> on his brothers. They were taking care of the sheep at a distant place. And the brothers, oh, the spy is here, you know. This guy, he's coming with his, his wonderful coat. <laughs> he thinks he's going to be king over us someday. He thinks he's the manager, you know. We're doing all the work in the field. He's coming just to check. How are you doing? Oh, are you working hard? Are you taking care of everything? Oh, you're playing around. I'm going to tell Dad, you know. You're not doing the work you should be doing. They resented that he was the one coming to check up on them. And he was wearing the coat of honor that his father had given him while they were out working in the fields taking care of the sheep, and that just made them angrier. 
So they grabbed him and they threw him in a hole. And uh, some of the brothers said we should kill him. <laughs> but uh, Reuben, the oldest brother, permitted that. And uh, and the brothers sold him as a slave. He ended up down in Egypt. And, uh, of course, in Egypt he became very successful in time, rising to a high position in the captain of the guard's household as a steward of the house because of his faithful service. And then, when everything seemed to be going well, his master's wife accused him of rape, sexual assault, which wasn't true, of course. And uh, his master was forced to put him in prison. The master didn't believe his wife. He didn't think that Joseph had acted in that way. He knew what Joseph was like. If he truly believed that Joseph had attacked his wife, Joseph would have been executed. He would not have been put in prison. He was put in prison to protect him <laughs> from the wife's anger. And in prison... Joseph met two royal officials who were also in prison for various reasons. The king was angry with them. And both of these men had dreams. And they shared their dreams with Joseph. And Joseph told them the meaning of the dreams. God revealed to him what each dream meant. One man would be restored to favor. The other would be executed. And the prediction, those predictions came true. The baker was executed, the steward was restored to his position. And of course, as you remember the story, later the king had a dream, which none of the Egyptian wise men, none of the Egyptian magicians could explain or interpret. And at that time, this steward remembered he remembered Joseph and told the king about him. And Joseph was brought to the court, and Joseph explained the meaning of the dream in a way that made sense, was logical to the Egyptians. And they accepted the warning that came from God through this dream, which Joseph interpreted. And so Joseph was placed in charge of the kingdom of Egypt. He became the prime minister, second only to the king. And he carried out this program of collecting the wheat and the grain, the surplus during the seven years of bounty, and purchased all of that from the people, and stored it for the future, made the preparation so it would be ready when the famine came. And when this famine struck, the grain that Joseph had stored up was used to feed the people of Egypt and also the people from the surrounding areas. It wasn't just Egypt, but even in Canaan, his own brothers and his family came to Egypt. And there were people from other areas which came to Egypt looking for food during this long and terrible famine which struck that area. And so the whole area of Palestine and Egypt was saved because of the dreams that Joseph interpreted and the actions that he took to, to prepare for this time. And, and so Joseph was a blessing to Egypt, he was a blessing to his family, he was a blessing to the whole region through the actions and the things that he did and the work that he did. These people that we've looked at this morning, their stories, while not always long and in great detail, they show us how God shared messages with the people of that place and time. Sometimes their messages were not accepted. Sometimes the messages were rejected. Sometimes people laughed and scoffed when these messages came. But we see that when the people accepted, when the people 
took to heart when the people followed the directions and the guidance given, great blessings came to the people or to the family or to the nation or to the region when God's warning was given. People do not always like the truth. People want to know the truth, but they don't always like it when they hear it. The truth is not always pleasant. Sometimes the truth is very painful. And yet, we as Christians need to share the truth that we have each day with the people around us. We need to be witnesses to what we know. Now, we may, we may not be prophets and prophetesses. God may not reveal Himself in visions or dreams to us, but He has revealed Himself in His written Word. And each one of us has a responsibility to share the truth, the knowledge, the wisdom contained in these pages with people around us. There are people looking for the truth. There are people who have problems, who need answers. And we can provide these. And we have an obligation and a responsibility as Christians to share the truth that we know and that we have with people around us. As Jesus told his disciples, hold up your light, <laughs> right? We have the children's song, you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We can't be embarrassed about being Christians. We cannot be embarrassed about the truth. We should not hide what we believe or what we are from people around us. We need to share, to hold up, to reveal the truth. Because the world is a dangerous place. And the world is facing a dangerous future. Destruction is coming. And people need to know. They need to know the danger, and they need to know the way out of the danger. And those messages and answers are found here. We have studied, we know, and we need to share what we know each day with those around us. Thank you.